I'm, I'm very pleased to be here, and uh, my abstract uh, read uh, Groundwater Management in Mexico, uh, my Embarking to New Horizons. And what I'm going to talk about is uh, ISMAR, actually, and what the process we had at the International Symposium of Manichoc for Recharge last week to talk about developing uh, new directives for groundwater, sustainable groundwater management. And um, I want to acknowledge my co-author, uh, Professor Adriana Palma Nava, and uh, noticed that uh, something happened with a shift in the word Mexico under my name. I'm not actually in Mexico. So anyways, apologizing for that. And also I want to acknowledge some of the other folks that had a, a major contribution to this. Roberto Ramirez is actually a presidential appointee, the Director General of the National Water Commission. And he's really the one that uh, motivated this. It was very interesting. Uh, Canagua, actually, the National Water Commission got uh, very much involved in planning ISMAR. And so we actually had a presidential appointee running a good deal of the meetings, which made some of us a little nervous. But uh, anyway, um, and then uh, Fernando Gonzalez um, is also a very important person. He was actually uh, the first uh, director of the National Water Commission. And of course, Adriana Palma and some of the other uh, folks that, uh, that uh, did participate in putting these, uh, uh, this document and these, this presentation together on the directives. Uh, so uh, as I touched on uh, a desired outcome that uh, Canagua wanted to have out of ISMAR since they were contributing to it was something related to helping them uh, characterize the problem and identify some of the things that they could do to help move things along in Mexico. Uh, they've got a lot of challenges, as I'll, as I'll touch on. So basically, there were a, an English version and a Spanish version, a Word document put together developing policy principles. I developed one in English, and it was largely based on, guess what, Sigma, which you've all heard about. And then uh, a Spanish uh, version was developed by uh, by one of the, uh, by the chief hydrogeologist for the National Water Commission. And so we had two special sessions at ISMAR, uh, one presenting uh, some of the various uh, groundwater management policies and principles from Australia, uh, from uh, European Union, and uh, from California, and then Mexico. And then we also had a, a session that, where we presented these directives toward the end and, and took input from the audience. And uh, we put condensed everything into one Word document at this point. It's all in English as yet, and a PowerPoint. And, uh, and they'll be revised, and we understand that the International Association of Hydrogeologists will take these up after we finish uh, this round. So um, now a little bit on uh, Mexico. Here's just some metrics, and I just want to point out there's a really nice book on, st on statistics of water in Mexico, and that's where this information comes from you're interested. And uh, so it's a, it's a pretty large country and 32 states, uh, about 2,500 municipalities, which are uh, composed of cities and counties and that kind of thing, and uh, have responsibilities for water management. There's 59 metropolitan areas that contain over half of the people and uh, 11.4 million that are considered disadvantaged. Uh, they've they've uh, designated 70, 731 watersheds, 51 main rivers, and 653 aquifers. Off-stream demands, everything that's uh, not an on-stream demand is an off-stream demand, <laughs> is, is the way it's characterized. And uh, so about 60% uh, uh, surface water and about 40% groundwater. And uh, the... Uh, uh, I'm not going to go into the GDP other than say th agriculture is 3.1%, uh, which isn't a lot. Now, looking at the precipitation distribution, it's kind of like California upside down, where they get a lot of precipitation in the south part of uh, Mexico and, and not so much in the north, and that presents the same kind of problems that we have in California. Um, renewable water resources, it's basically what that means is what's the uh, sustainable yield in a given year, uh, taking into account both surface water and groundwater. And just some metrics on that, uh, about uh, 1,600 cubic meter per person per year in the beige area, the drier part of the, of the country, and then about 10,800 cubic meters per year 
in the south part of the country. And I'm skipping through these pretty quickly because I want to get to the directives, but I wanted to give you some background. Uh, the proportional water demand, agriculture is at about 78%. Uh, then public supplies, about 14%. Then we have industry and energy generation, and that excludes hydropower. So that gives you a little handle on that. Uh, there's been three stages of uh, sustainable water policy development. The first stage, back in the 1900s, started as kind of a supply side focused construction of uh, the, the large uh, reservoirs at the surface, aqueducts and other systems and creation of uh, irrigation uh, uh, mechanisms. And then the second stage, 1980s and 90s, it's more demand-oriented water policy with more decentralization and responsibility for drinking water supply, sewerage and sanitation services were transferred to the municipalities from Kanagawa, uh, which was created to maintain water uh, resources at the national level. And then, uh, creation of a public registry of water duties to track water allocation. And then finally, the third stage is, is increasing uh, water reuse. As an example, the Anton Antotonilco plant, which has uh, recently come into operation, is handling 50% of the waste discharge from the whole Mexico City Valley. And it will include, uh, I think it will take on much more. Uh, so, uh, and that's, uh, that's uh, I think, the largest wastewater treatment plant in Latin America. I see somebody shaking their head, perhaps from Mexico. <laughs> okay, I meant to check that. So uh, I don't pretend to be an expert on these subjects, I'm, I, uh, but I do know a little bit, and, uh, and I, I just want to share with you this, uh, these directives. So, uh, and then uh, more emphasis placed on demand management through extraction accounting, uh, aquifer and watershed regulation, then updating the fee schedules and collections for water use. By the way, agriculture doesn't pay. Uh, that's another uh, consideration. Um, so the current uh, legal uh, policy and institutional framework, uh, water is uh, the property of the federal government. And uh, the National Water Commission was established to be the administrator of a, large, a lot of these things, to set water rights. And uh, their principle is water pays for water, so the fees should pay for all the infrastructure and management. Uh, they have state water commissions, basin authorities, river basin councils, which are more stakeholder uh, input, along with the auxiliary bodies. And so there's a lot of good input at different levels, but the uh, Basin authorities, the state water commission, the municipalities, and Kanagawa really run the system. All of these different organizations uh, that run these different systems have plans, but from what I can tell, uh, they aren't integrated. So, so they have separate plans, and that's one of the things that we've identified as uh, could be useful to uh, try to integrate. Uh, current uh, groundwater conditions and changes. So uh, I mentioned there's 60... 653 aquifers, 106 are in overdrafts, 31 have salinity issues, 15 seawater intrusion. They have prohibition zones um, uh, established for 145, incentive and regulated zones, and then 333 with suspended free withdrawal. And I'm not sure exactly what that means, but I, I, I'll just say that they've got these different mechanisms in place, but they're still having uh, problems with uh, over-exploitation. And that, that is the quandary. Uh, sound familiar? Um, anyway, uh, water supply, um, up, up to 35% leakage has been identified. And there's uh, some issues with the purification plants and conveyance networks. And then Mexico City, uh, groundwater is dropping about a meter per year. And in places, in land subsidence, up to 0.3 meters per year and over nine meters of subsidence. If you ever ran, walk around Mexico City, you'll see buildings that have steps down to them that used to be at street level. Some of the major, uh, and I, uh, like on the Reforma, there's a major statue there that's got a deep foundation. It's like 26 feet above the street because it's not, it's not going anywhere, but the land's going down. And then uh, they've identified in the Mexico uh, City Central Valley that they've got about 40 years left on uh, groundwater. So this is a pretty serious uh, situation. The degree of water stress, uh, this is identified by looking at the available uh, amount of water, of renewable water resources, um, and the volume that's being uh, used. And so this just identifies different levels of water stress in the uh, area. And then uh, a couple of maps on 
overdraft up in the right. So those uh, little red uh, places are uh, aquifers that are in overdraft, a map of availability where there are groundwater supplies available, and then the blue ones are the ones that are under regulation. I want to point out that Kanagawa is currently uh, evaluating about 30 aquifers uh, doing a regulatory review, looking at supply, strictly looking at uh, the renewable water resources versus the demand. And they're going to re-regulate those. They're going to use that as a framework then to set regulations on a state-by-state -state basis. So they're starting a new process. Immediately following that might be the time to start developing some integrated plans, integrated across the institutions. So uh, we uh, talked about developing these policy directives for sustainable groundwater management. And uh, we started with these two papers and then uh, met with uh, a number of executives at Kanagawa and uh, came up with uh, six, six crisp messages one-line messages that we filled in, and that's what I'm going to talk through right now. This really developed for decision makers and the general public to help them understand about aquifers and uh, some of the challenges we have and what we have to do move, moving forward. And so some of the key principles in true include groundwater is essential for water and food security, public health and so socioeconomic well-being. Groundwater is a common pool resource subject to the tragedy of the commons. And some of the emerging, emerging challenges include climate change and rising pressures from increasing demands. And groundwater should be sustainably managed. Those are some of the key principles. So the first uh, directive is recognize aquifers as critically important, finite, valuable, and vulnerable resources. They supply up to 50% uh, of the demand globally, and they provide resiliency for drought management and they're limited in a vulnerable resource, part of the hydrologic cycle and connected to surface water. And finally, they're widely thought to be limitless, endless in supply. And so that's a misnomer. Uh, halt chronic aquifer depletion on a global basis. So this is one of, uh, one of the key uh, directives. We need to uh, figure out how to stop uh, uh, many of the world's aquifers from being overexploited and depleted at increasing rates. And groundwater sustainability indicator evidence includes, and you may recognize these if you've been following sigma, declining groundwater levels and loss of storage, water quality degradation, land subsidence, seawater intrusion, loss of springs, ecosystems, and base flows. And it's essential to invest new efforts and resources to establish regulations and management as needed to reach sustainability. And then aquifer systems are unique, need to be well understood, and groundwater should be invisible no more. So those are, that's another key tenet. And that they're all unique and diverse, and that it's essential to know about the geometry, the chemi chemistry and physical characteristics, hydrology trends and interconnectedness with surface water, and uh, the water balance and availability, current and future demands, and climate change and how that's going to affect. Increasing the knowledge on aquifers to improve tools and innovative technologies is another key point. And knowledge and data on aquifer systems need to be shared. Everybody needs to know about these things. Aquifers need to be sustainably managed. So this, I'm not going to go into detail on this. You've probably heard plenty of this. On, uh, and it's kind of, again, follows kind of the tenets of Sigma, but increasing and sustained adequate investment. That's, you know, we all know this is going to cost more to raise the bar. That's what we're being asked to do here in this state. And it, we really need to talk about it globally if we're going to maintain this world. And you need to have appropriate policy, legal, and regulatory framework, institutions covering the entire aquifer systems, integration of planning and coordination and action uh, amongst users and management institutions, intervention and enforcement mechanisms when they don't, when, when it's not uh, working. And then finally, knowing the amount of available supply in order to balance that with short and long-term demands. And then uh, aquifers need to be sustainably managed through planning processes. So you need to develop comprehensive plans to cover these things. And uh, I'm not going to go into detail on that. I think uh, if you look at the sigma, you may find a lot of similarity in terms of what goes into a plan. But really, uh, considering what kind of management actions you can take. 
And then uh, managed aquifer recharge needs to be greatly increased globally in order to be sustainable. And uh, Mars' objective is to increase groundwater recharge over natural and fermentation processes. And it's a demonstrated groundwater management component to achieving long-term sustainability. And incentives should be provided to increase application, uh, as they're trying to do in Pajaro Valley, for example. We need to figure out those incentives. And then MAR may increase storage and augment supply, improve water quality, and provide resiliency and should be implemented were the projects uh, economically viable, suitable lock for, and uh, within uh, areas being actively managed. So there's management mechanisms in place. And effective groundwater management requires collaboration and robust stakeholder involvement. That's a final key tenet. And I think we all know that if we're working in this water industry, got to educate the people, got to get them on board, because they're going to have to pay, right? Anyway, uh, next steps. Uh, with these policy directives, we're going to continue editing this in a small group, get it uh, wrapped up in the next few weeks, and probably discuss it in Montpellier at IH Commission. And then Mexico, uh, the desire to address groundwater management and depletion, recognition that may require new legislation and or policy changes, and it may accomplish uh, through uh, legislative and regulatory actions and mandates. So that's it, and uh, I thank you for your attention. Oh, you mean in Mexico? Yeah. Uh, you know, I wish I knew. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's been an interesting ride. We started this process uh, three years ago when I met uh, Fernando and Adriana in San Francisco at this hotel when uh, GRA did a Managed Aquifer Recharge conference, which I chaired. And uh, so we started that dialogue. And uh, I think, uh, you know, the, the timing is right in many ways, but the but the political environment down there is, is uh, as it is in many countries, it changes. So uh, I know that right now they're looking at uh, developing uh, these new regulatory mechanisms for the aquifers and moving forward on that. I know there's interest in doing some planning uh, in the Mexico City Valley. So that may happen in the next couple of years. But uh, overall, uh, you know, they're like uh, a lot of countries out there that have problems that are difficult to solve, so it's very challenging, and no firm schedule or budget. Another question? So I was interested, Mexico, Mexico produces uh, a decent crop of pecans, nueces, and so you have the same issue of perennial crops there. Right. Um, are you looking at that? I mean, in Chihuahua, Sonora, uh, New Overwhelm, you know, there's, there's actually, you know, I think 100,000 acres, maybe, of, of, uh, of pecans. Yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not looking at, uh, at crops. You know, I'm, I'm actually uh, more, I'm, I've been involved in this and really looking at the planning side of things. Obviously, those kind of things would come up on local plants. But I think just kind of summarize, uh, this is kind of a real top-down looking at how to, uh, I think, uh, engage get engaged, uh, locals more engaged in terms of solving the problem instead of having it dictated down from the federal government. Because setting the mandates that, uh, you know, slow the pumping down, pump less, don't pump, you, you, it doesn't work uh, in, many, in most places. You have to get people on board with it and come up with joint solutions. We, we learned that here. I think we learn it everywhere. So uh, I think that's where we're really, they're really focusing and trying to come up with some more integrated, comprehensive plans across multiple institutions within aquifer systems. Time for one more. Thanks. Um, I thought those principles were excellent. I think you really nailed um, those six. My question was kind of what happens after you go to the next IAH conference, and, and what will they be used for? Kind of what's the long game with those principles? Well, you know, so we have a three-page document, and we have a PowerPoint. And, and we're hoping that this can be something that gets, uh, uh, well, I think that IAH will take it up and develop something. Uh, we're also talking about, 
you know, they have a governance commission, they have a managed lock for recharge commission, so now we're talking about a groundwater management commission. So there isn't one of those, and comprehensive groundwater management planning includes governments, but it's a lot more than that. So we're talking about something along those lines. This is really a communication tool is really what it is. It's to set out the global picture and try to give, uh, it, it started as a tool for the Mexican government, the National Water Commission, to come up with something that then they could take out to their staff, take out to the different districts, take out to the president, who knows, and talk about the severity of the problem and what's needed in terms of simple steps that they can understand. Uh, simple steps to move things forward in the right direction. So that's what we're hoping. And uh, it was interesting trying to keep it to three pages is all I can say. And then having interaction with audiences about that when you're wordsmithing, it's, uh, it's a difficult assignment that, uh, that was had. And uh, uh, several of us sat in a room during ISMAR oh, for a day when we thought it was going to be a couple of hours to, to craft this Word document. And uh, I'm just glad that uh, we got where we got and uh, hope to see some uh, CIH uh, move it forward. And I th I, they seem very positive. Antonio Chambel, who's the president-elect for IAH, was there, along with Peter Dillon, Sharon Megdahl, who are all involved with IAH. So we're very, uh, very uh, happy to have their support. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks,